Hey everyone, this week I thought we'd take a look at Scotland, or more specifically the way the place has been managed by the SNP, which for decades were an opposition party with one policy, until following the referendum and subsequent election when they walked into the sort of supermajority and absolute control you'd normally only expect to see in a country near the equator with nicer weather. Nicola Sturgeon and her supporters all quickly embraced the idea of Scotland being a one-party state, although those have famously not been especially good governments from which to copy ideas, the one exception perhaps being ancient Egypt, which lasted a few thousand years before being eventually brought down by a pyramid scheme. Since then, though, the party has had to go all sorts of things, including running schools, buying a railway, all of it shambolic. It sort of reminds me how the Chuckle Brothers used to turn up every week trying a different job from the one before, hoping things would work out better this time, and as always, things would turn out badly, but the BBC would keep letting them have another go and not criticise them. First of all, let's look at the economy. On paper, the Scottish government had a deficit of more than 22% last year, compared to around 15% for the UK as a whole, which is pretty shocking. When it comes to three-letter acronyms, that really puts the SNP up there with BHS and AOL when it comes to running a business badly. Although perhaps a better one would have been the bank, RBS, which for a while had a balance sheet larger than the entire Scottish economy before it turned out that asking Fred Goodwin to run a bank was a bit like asking Ian Blackford to lose three stone. When I was a kid, they would casually throw around ideas about reopening the coal mines of the shipyards or how oil would pay for everything, but then they decided that net zero was a vote winner, so the oil's out the door. Presumably the strategy now is to join the EU and get given money as part of a grand plan for Brussels to embarrass England, although nobody has a clue what currency an independent Scotland would actually use, and the EU have all but confirmed that they wouldn't be allowed in any way, simply on the basis of Spain and Italy vetoing them, fearful of encouraging their own nationalist movements. Let's look at some specific economic examples though. The SNP's first go at nationalisation was when they took ownership of Presswick Airport in 2013. After buying the failing airport for £1, Edinburgh then paid the airport directors bonuses of £200,000 and spent over 40 million quid to keep it going as a quote, going concern. In the meantime, any money it was earning was largely as a result of President Trump, who took up the offer of a military refuelling station. Although I'm not really sure how Nicola and her peacenik friends feel about using taxpayer money to bankroll Donald Trump and his ability to send weapons of war to the Middle East, let alone ferry people to a new golf course. Then in 2019, there was the announcement that the Scottish government would take over the Ferguson dockyard in Port Glasgow rather than see it go bankrupt. In order to do so, they'd have to buy two new ferries, either of which have been completed, of course, although the costs have subsequently risen to £250 million, and arguments have thus broken out about both senior management pay as well as who even signed off in the contract in the first place. Due to failures in the design process, the ferries have windows painted onto the side of them rather than having actual windows. And that just about sums up how well things are going, but as they say in management, if at first you don't succeed, redefine success. So what's another name for a long-term investment? Answer, a failed short-term investment. Moving on this year saw yet another go to business as the ScotRail franchise was brought into public ownership. Everyone on the left knows that changing the ownership and redesigning the logo is all you need to fix long-term structural issues, especially with the most hallowed of industries, the railways. And so shortly afterwards, no silver bullet was found and an emergency timetable was imposed on all services that weren't themselves cancelled. It sort of reminds me about that one about the hot air ballooning business that never took off. Yeah. We could also talk about the Loch Aber smelter debacle, but change of topic here. The census. That's a pretty difficult one to mess up. Every 10 years you get a very accurate headcount and you use it to plan public services. The turnout's normally about 97 or 98 percent, except that the SNP decided that it would obstinately do it at a different time from the one in England and Wales, blaming Covid, but it was largely so they could re-engineer sections of it. This included sections about race and gender that were very woke, but left very blank by vast swathes of a confused public, as well as a requirement to use a computer, which immediately left it inaccessible to many of the elderly, but also the disabled and those without a decent internet connection, not something that rural Scotland is best known for. There's a £1,000 fine if you don't hand it in in time, although given that 1 in 10 of the population haven't handed it in, I frankly question the ability for the courts to even process that many cases, or the government to collect the money efficiently if they could. Although it would go some way in paying the cost of the debacle, so far this has cost £148 million in a country that only has 5.5 million people to begin with, uh, at least the last time a British-run census was undertaken. There are a litany of other angles we could attack the SNP's policies from. There's the minimum alcohol pricing policy, which did exactly as its opponents said it would, and drove poor people to buy less food rather than go teetotal. There's a drugs policy that saw just shy of 1,300 drug-related deaths in 2021, which was the second highest ever. The highest ever, by the way, was the previous year, which had been the highest since records began. There's educational decline with a focus in promoting walkery and tinkering here, although with the exception of history, which I think is the only one subject the SNP really cares strongly about, because it clearly isn't economics or critical thinking. Nearly a decade ago, a new curriculum was launched and Nicola Sturgeon went on record, quote, let me be clear, I want to be judged on this, although those targets were very recently and quite quietly abandoned. You get the impression that no one really cares about any of this stuff because they didn't join the SNP to run a school or get involved in social work. It's always been about getting another referendum and another one after that until they can finally get a yes vote and move on to better paid jobs in Europe or perhaps lecturing in America or, or maybe being an ambassador to somewhere. 
the ethics and moral compasses though have been very clear on display in the last couple of years. There was the court case against Alex Salmond where he was finally acquitted, although only after it became clear that members of the SNP had personally tried to influence the judiciary. Just weeks before the trial began, Derek Mackay, Sturgeon's finance minister, was forced to resign after a series of inappropriate texts to a 16-year-old boy. Finance scandals abound with a series of corruption and embezzlement allegations regarding what happened to money earmarked for a second referendum. That was going to be a huge news story, but events overtook it with yet more CD behaviour coming out. Ian Blackford is the SNP's head person at Westminster, and when he wasn't wearing a suit that looked like it was made out of carpet tiles, he was spending years telling people that the SNP had a zero-tolerance approach to the sort of things that the Tories or the likes did, certainly not them. But then he decided to express political solidarity for Patrick Grady, the former whip who was then shown to have been sexually harassing a party staffer. All of this is what supposedly underpins the nationalistic message that Scotland would be better run independently by the SNP, on the clearly farcical idea that Scottish, especially SNP politicians, are innately better and more moral than those from England, especially a posh English person like David Cameron, whose father was actually from Aberdeenshire. The rule by England policy is actually quite ridiculous because when you look at it, you had two decades of Scottish rule because half the Labour cabinets were from Scotland, including both Prime Ministers. There was a reason why it was called the British Empire and not the English Empire. But so finally we get to the unknown question about whether or not there will be a second referendum or not, or whether simply declining to call it would cause nationalistic unrest and further the SNP's cause with expressions like thwarting the will of the people, carrying a lot more emotive weight than, quote, once in a lifetime. Curiously, in 2017, Boris Johnson was still Foreign Secretary, and he stood by the Spanish government's decision to, quote, uphold their constitution, and that included deploying the Garda Civil to prevent people in Catalonia from voting. I wonder what ever happened to that guy, Boris. Anyway. Like this, click subscribe.